All right. Uh, welcome to A Better Lifestyle, everybody. My name is Richard Esperance. So I go by the name of my man, Richard. Today, I have uh, the pleasure to have uh, Tabata Torell with me. And uh, welcome, Tabata, to the show. Thank you so much, Richard, for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> no problem. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your story, and uh, we'll get started. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I live in rural Nebraska, born and raised. I married my high school sweetheart. We have five beautiful daughters. We run multiple businesses. Um, I always had a passion for helping people. And I came from a family where money was always a struggle. So I knew if I was going to get anywhere, do anything, I was going to have to work hard for what I had. And I just kind of took that work ethic into my life and my marriage and every aspect. And this is where I'm at today. Uh, so tell us, uh, I know you talk a, uh, a lot about legacy. Uh, what does legacy mean to you? So for me, legacy is what you leave behind. And so we're all here on this planet for a purpose. And what you do with it, your chance on this earth is your decision, is your choice. And so for me, when I'm talking legacy, I mean, obviously I'm a mom and I'm a wife and I am a daughter and I'm a sister. And so the impact that I have on people is really important to me. And it's it really is the impact that you leave on people, how you make them feel, what you do with the talents and the gifts that you are given on earth and how that is multiplied and how that is mimicked by your children or the people that are around you, how you ins are inspiring to people to want to live better, want to live a more fulfilled, more passionate life. And for me, when you can leave a legacy where people are like, man, they were truly inspiring. They lived life to the fullest. They were full of passion. They were, you know, living this life. I, I admire that. I want to pursue that myself. That to me is kind of the ultimate legacy. Uh, so how do you balance everything? Because uh, I know you have a podcast, you do the real estate. Uh, I yep. believe you have uh, five kids, I believe. Correct me if I'm yep. wrong. Yep. Uh, yes. So how do you balance everything? I get this question probably the most out of <laughs> every question that I get. And I say, it's not really a balance of time. It's a balance of mind. And I, wherever I need to be in that moment in that day is where I need to be. So right here in this moment, I am present. I am giving everything that I have. This is my priority at this moment. And, but I have to manage my mind on that. I have to balance my mind. And if you're, if your audience is looking for any sort of balance in life, which, you know, you hear that a lot, it's really a fallacy because whenever you think, when I think of a balance, I think of equal, right? Like everything has to be equal. Well, that's just not reality because wherever you're at in that moment, you should have everything there, not half, not a fourth, not a, you know, what, however you're being pulled. And so for me, it's balancing my emotions. What I mean by that, Richard, is wherever I'm at, I am. So if my kids, like before I left today, they're, you know, they're of course like, mommy, I want you, you know, you play with me. We love you. And of course my heart is pulled to stay with them right in that moment. But I have responsibilities and obligations to be here right now. And I know that I'm here and I'm present for the next, I have, you know, a, a pretty full day, but it's still about four and a half hours of work. And so in this moment, I am totally present. And so I balance my emotions, meaning I don't act on them. You know, my, as a woman, you know, I'm a very emotional being and I'm very passionate. So I can, you know, just want to be like, no, I just want to give up everything or, oh, I'm over here and I'm happy and I'm flighty and I want to do these things, but managing my emotions, balancing my emotions and saying, this is where I need to be right now. And I'm present and I love it. And I'm going to get every bit that I can in this moment. And then when I go home and with my kids, I'm with my kids and I'm totally present and in the moment and feeling joy and giving all the fruits that I need in that moment. And for me, that's where I find the balance. I have to go home and take inventory and say, where's my health at? Where's my relationship at? What are my priorities? What am I putting above something that needs that priority? Is it 
right now? Is it financial? Do we need some sort of income? Does that need to be a priority? Or my kids, are they needing me right now? I have five girls that range from toddler to teenager. So where are they at? Do they need mom in this moment right now? Are they good? Are they, you know, they're with their friends, they're loving life, they're at school, not over analyzing, oh, but I should be there. And I think that's what a lot of people do. They say, well, I should be doing this. I should be this. I should be. Who told you that you should be that? Right? Like, so checking where your priorities are and where you feel centered and where you feel complete and where you feel whole. And if I don't feel like that, then I have to check it and say, okay, what am I people pleasing? Where am I like putting stuff that doesn't need to be done just you know, for acknowledgement, just for accolades, or am I where I'm supposed to be right now? Because this is where I'm called to be at. Your spouse, your spouse is your partner. And uh, uh, how is it working with your spouse? And how do you guys uh, complement each other? Oh, well, I love working with him and I'd work with him all day, every day. Um, (laughs) But we don't, we only get to work together a, a small portion of the time. We are complete opposites in regards to our personality type. Now, we're not opposite when it comes to like our ethics, our morals, like what we want out of life that we're in total sync and in total alignment. And but as far as skill sets and personality, he is very like easygoing, patient. He likes he's a little bit more like takes a little bit longer to make decisions. He kind of goes with the flow easy. I'm a little bit more. Uh, B, I like to make decisions fast. I like to talk a lot. He doesn't talk very much, you know. Um, So we complement each other in that where it does make a really good match because I will just say, like, let's do it. Like, let's jump into this, you know, real estate deal or this business. And sometimes he kind of pulls him back a little bit and just says, okay, that's great. But let's just look at this from the family dynamic, the full, you know, bird's eye view. Let's take a minute. Let's work through this. Or if I get really impatient with something, you know, he helps me become a better person and step back and say, you know what, what needs to be done here? I look at things through his perspective, but vice versa. So like for him, it might be he dragging his feet. He's not quite certain. And I tell him like, hey, let's jump in. What's the worst that can happen? You know, like I give him a fresh perspective of take making those decisions in our life and saying, if we're good, if him and I are good, every, nothing else matters. Like businesses can fall. And yes, that's scary. And I say this and people are like, but Tab, you don't know. I do know because we have struggled financially. Both of us, both of us and our parents struggled financially. We know what it means for lack and scarcity. I mean, I remember when my little, my girls were little going to the grocery store and my debit card getting declined and being like having that gut wrenching feeling of, oh my gosh, we don't have enough money in our account and having to put stuff back. Like, I know what that feels like, but I also know that when him and I are good, our relationship, our core foundation is good. We could be on food stamps and it's fine because we'll find a way out. We'll figure it out. We will be united and there's always a way out. Like money is not scarce. And so even with health and trusting and and our faith and and things like that, like if we're good, everything else is good. Uh, business is a lot about networking and, uh, also when it comes to real estate, that's very important. How yeah. was your, how was your networking journey, uh, in regards to that? So we're always networking. I mean, I am involved in like different masterminds, different groups, every event that we go to every convention, anything like that, you know, we're constantly talking with people. I'm looking at different groups that we can join because I know, the sum of our life is really who we surround ourselves with. And so when we really took a hold of that and said, like, I will invest in other programs and other groups so that I am around other high level people, that's when our business it skyrocketed. That's when not only just financially, but just kind of the freedom of it. Like when I tell you, like we could lose everything and yes, it'd be scary. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't have some like gut wrenching moments, But at the same time, it wouldn't be like the end all because I know what it takes to build back up. I have developed a mindset and a network of people that I could call somebody and be like, hey, 
what can I do for you? X, Y, Z. Like, can I, you know, do this? I know what it takes to even earn an extra, you know, thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, those type of things. And and it's knowing those people and having those people surround you that makes the difference. Now, some people think, you know, you have to be networking 24 seven and on the phone. And that's just not true. You take the relationships that are worth it to you and you spend time with that. You know, you invest time and and effort into those. And that's just kind of what we've done. That's how we were able to build our real estate where it is today, just because the relationships that we had built, even when my husband was a teenager. So just every, every person you meet does matter, whether you think they do or not. Uh, when it comes to financing, do you have any uh, creative ways for uh, getting financing? <clears throat> oh, there's a lot of creative ways. Uh, <laughs> um, honestly, your communication skills, if you can develop one skill, if you're interested in real estate and you're like, Tab, I don't know, and I don't know all the lingo, I don't either. My husband is the one that like, does most of the contracts and like all the, like, I still will Google different definitions of things if I'm talking with people. I mean, I'm just being real because I'm a people person. So I'd rather talk with someone. So, but when you can communicate to a banker, or when you can communicate to a seller, like this is what your intention is. And you can figure out and you can listen to why they're selling. There's always a way. There's seller finance, there's owner finance, there's um, you know, hard money loans. You can go to 10 different banks. I mean, one of the best pieces of advice, we personally haven't had to do this because we have good relationships with the bank that we use, but we went to a conference in December and the woman said, I list out 10 banks before I even go ask anybody. I list out 10 banks. And I just assume that the first five are going to tell me no. Like she just knows and she just goes, but she goes with every bank with intention and she learns something. Every bank that tells her no, every person that tells her no, she asks them, why? why did you tell me no? And they'll tell her. And then so for the next bank, she solves that problem. You know, if it's that you have bad credit, if that you have this, who can you have back you? Again, it's relationships. Could somebody come in and co-sign for you? Could you go to somebody that you know that would help you with the down payment that maybe would be a partner that you could give them equity in? You know, it's about if you don't have the money, you have to have the people bring people to the party who have the money. And you might say, Tab, I don't know anybody with money. Yes, you do. It's about sitting down and looking at your relationships and then communicating to that person why you want to buy that property. What's in it for them? How is it a win for them? Maybe they loan you the money and you say, okay, after the first year when I'm this amount positive, then I'll start paying you back or I'll double or whatever, like whatever terms you want to work with. And when you can communicate that with passion, like you bring your passion to the table, like don't just be like numbers person, like, you know, sitting here like, do, do, do. no, like even a banker. I mean, I've heard stories where like tellers are like signing off on these people that shouldn't get the loans to, to push it through to the loan person because that person came with so much passion. But so many times when people don't know real estate, they come scared. And so people are like timid and they're like, well, you know, I don't, I know I don't have very much money, blah, blah, blah. No one's going to buy, no one's going to give you money of like any substantial amount. But when you can come with certainty, like I will make this property and, you know, and you come with your numbers and you come with communication I mean, and you you have the tenacity for it. The only person that's stopping is you. So what would you say like uh, in regards to like, uh, like, uh, so the whole process is about selling yourself. What would you say? Uh, you said passion before. Are there any things like uh, people could do like to sell themselves better? Well, bringing up the energy, like I said, knowing why, this is the first thing that I tell people, why do you want to buy that piece of real estate? There's always a reason. Like, I it, it, I don't care if it's a storage unit. I don't care if it's an RV site. I don't care if it's a single family home, apartment building. There is a reason why you want to buy that. And you, most people are like, well, I want the income. Like, I want the money. I want the, but why? What would that do for you? Well, I need to feed my family. Like, I have a family of three. Okay, why? Like, you have to dig to that why of saying, okay, for me, my dad worked 18, 19 hours a day. I never saw him. I knew when I got married to my husband that I wanted him to be present 
in my daughter's life. I did not want him working those same kind of hours. And I didn't want to worry about what were we going to do if we didn't have a retirement plan. So we bought our first house when we were 19 and 21, because I knew there were deep wounds early on that I said, I don't want my kids. I don't want that legacy for them. I don't want that generational curse of scarcity and you know lack. So we knew early on. Now, that got us and the relationship got us our first house. So when you go somewhere and you're talking with someone, I don't care if it's a banker, an accountant, I don't care how dull and boring their personality is when you can come and sell yourself and have the numbers, like be prepared, be certain. Like, I know I can do this because somebody else did it. So I know that you can, you know, I'm not any better than you, Richard. I'm not Grant Cardone is not better than me. He was just smart and strategic and did things at a faster pace and had a bit bigger network of people, but he started somewhere. And so everybody has to start somewhere. And when you can go and you have this house and the numbers are good and it's going to be cash flow positive and you can come to a lender and say, I have this. And if the lender's not going to do it, be creative, get inside these groups. There's investors, there's people you can partner with, give them equity. There's always a way. And once you have that first house, that's just the leverage you need for the second house or the second property or wherever you're at. And then you leverage that. And then it's then it's a domino effect. But so many people get bogged down with that first step. And really, it's not as difficult as we make it in here. Uh, what type of real estate, uh, what type of real estate do you invest in? We predominantly invest in single family properties. Just because it has netted us an ROI that's surpassed anything that we could do. Now we are starting to look into, like right now we're in contract for um, storage units and doing built like apartment buildings, like 40 units, 80 units. Um, we have never done like syndications, but that's something that we're looking into right now. We're also looking at being lenders for other people that want to start in like the wholesaling market and um, and other real estate ventures that just can't get their capital in check. So that's where we start. And I tell people a single family home is probably the, the easiest barrier to entry because if you try to start too big and there's too many moving parts and you've never done anything in real estate, it can be so overwhelming that you don't even want to start. And you can literally start with a single family home without even an LLC. Like you can go and just do it. Now, yes, you want to get an LLC. Yes, you want to get yourself protected, but you don't need those things to start. And so many people think that they need all these things to start and they really don't. They need a lease agreement that's binding in their state, which is you can get online and you need a house and you need to go and do a little research on the house to make sure it's cash flow positive. And then you go to the bank and you say, this is what it is. This is how it is. This is what I want. Or you can go to the seller and say, hey, I'll take over your loan for you. Let's work on terms, right? So like you don't even need a bank. So you just have to be creative and have a little bit of tenacity and put a little work into it and say, this is what I want to do. And this is why I'm doing it. You talk about syndications before, for people mm -hmm. who don't know, can you explain what uh, syndication is? Yeah. So syndication would be like you literally, this is probably the most passive way to be involved in real estate. I don't, I personally have never done it. So I can't say it's like the most risky, but literally it's like you take a portion of your money and you say, so, say somebody has, wants to do a $2 million ap apartment complex. And what they do is they go find people that are willing to invest however much money. Sometimes it's like you have to invest at least 20,000. Um, it just depends on the syndication who's doing it. Sometimes it can be smaller. And then you get a percentage of that every single month. Um, depend Again, the slice of the pie depends on how much percentage you get back. And then somebody else manages it. Somebody else takes care of that property for you. So really hands off. There's a lot of like legal things and back-end things um, that you have to, you know, do. But for, for you, if somebody was like, well, I just want to put my money in and, and like, just let it grow. Great. I don't know numbers on that, like what the ROI is, if it would be better to put it in stocks or that, but it'd be it'd be similar to stocks because your ROI isn't as good as if you were to do it like yourself. Like for us, our, our ROI is about anywhere from 12 to 14 percent. And, you know, I think stocks good 
six to eight percent. Don't quote me on that because I don't know. My husband knows more of like the numbers. This is why we don't do stocks. This is why we do real estate. Syndication would be more like the lower percentage because you're not involved. Like you literally just hand off your money, you trust them, and you you get your return. Usually, like I don't think it's usually every month. I think it's like quarterly. You will get like a check for that, and then you you roll with it. I don't believe you can use that for like tax purposes and equity. You might be able to a little bit, but not as much as if you had your own property. See, that's what why we another reason why we do houses is for tax savings. And in syndications, you're limited on what you can use for tax strategy and, and my understanding. But I could be wrong. And if I am, please <laughs> message me on Instagram. But for my understanding, this is not my area of expertise. This is why we have tax strategists and why we have people. But um, it's just more of a hands off way. Like if you just want to be like, hey, invest in this find somebody you trust. That's another thing, you know, like you have to trust this person um, to do the deal and to just be kind of like a silent partner. Uh, so how was your growth, like your journey as an entrepreneur, the growth that you've uh, uh, encountered in, uh, in your journey as an entrepreneur and as a real estate investor? Oh, like leaps and bounds. I mean, every day I'm growing. Every day I'm learning. I humble myself every day. I don't care what our real estate portfolio or what our bank account says. Like I am, I always try to be the stupidest person in the room. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to always learning of like what it takes, especially in real estate, because I was more the back end person. My husband was always the one who was like doing the deals and, you know, doing, having all the language and the contracts. I would just come in and like make the properties pretty and like, you know, we'd property manage them and do that kind of stuff. Um, I was more the silent. And then now this year I'm learning more and doing different things, especially with like lending and money and creative finance and helping other people. Cause that's my skill set is coaching. I've been a coach for over 16 years. So like helping other people make it really simple for them. So they're not over stimulated with all the language and then they don't get started and everybody can have a piece of the real estate pie. It's not for the elite. It's not for just the Grant Cardones of the world or whoever you think that has all the money Money is out there and there are lenders and there are people that want to partner up and they might want to be the silent partner and you do all the work, you know, and they can just take a percentage of it. So I just like to help people do that. And so I'm constantly learning and growing and joining these masterminds and spending, you know, five figures for masterminds to be in rooms where people are making more than me, doing more than me, have better marriages than me, are better parents than me, like doing the work of that. And it's a constant journey. And I think for me, I will always be thankful for entrepreneurship because that's what forced me to do it. But now just in every aspect of life, I'm doing it and loving it. And it's hard and there's frustrations and there's challenges, but in that is so much growth. And that's why we're here. We're meant to grow and develop constantly. I don't care what age you are. I don't care if you're 90. Like if you can make an impact and have passion and learn and grow, I want to be 90. I want to be 99 and like reading books and, and speaking. And um, Betty White is one of, honestly, like I think one of my role models because she constantly was doing stuff like all the time. I don't care how old she was, how tired she was. Now she was not a mom. But like she was so engulfed in her charities and like what she wanted to do and every day, even like clear up still, like just she's so amazing. And so for me to to look at that and say, I'm only 39, like there's a lot of life and a lot of, of things to do. There's no retirement age for me. There's no stopping point until I'm dead. Like I'm going to be learning and growing in any way that I can. In this environment of uh, high interest rates, uh, are you, uh, do you have a different strategy? We don't because of the relationships that we have, but I always tell people, this is where the creative finance comes in. So if you are somebody that's like, you know, you can't get something in the interest rates are, this is where the creative finance, this is where you go to the seller and say, Hey, can I take over your loan? Can I, uh, cause their interest rate is most likely going to be lower than what, there than what you could get. Right. So instead of like 
taking out another loan for the bank and having a higher interest rate, go to that person and say, hey, can I take this out? Now, you have to have your communication skills. You can't just go to them and say this. They're going to think this is like a Ponzi scheme. If they don't know real estate or they've had a lot of people come and they don't trust them, there's a lot of sleazy people in the real estate world. Like it is, it can be a shark infested waters. And so when somebody has something that somebody wants, somebody can come to them and manipulate them. So you have to have effective communication in that. And you have to come to them and make it a win-win for everybody. And so you have to be, you know, again, creative in that, finding other investors, um, go to other banks, work with your relationships. Can you get that down? They say, no, it has to be this, but can you come at them and say, no, it has to be this. Right. But when you're effective negotiator, effective communicator, and you know the value and you know what you can do and don't ever get emotionally invested in a property, like don't think like, oh, my gosh, this is the one that I have to have. If I don't have it, then the world's going to end because then you have no leverage. But if you go to it with this, like there's other properties or there's other opportunities and but I'm going to do the best that I can to get this, to make it a win for the seller and a win for you as the buyer, then finance, like money, it doesn't really matter if you can make the numbers work. That's what I tell people. Like if I told you right now, you had to come up with a million dollars, but I told you that every single month, no matter what, you could make a thousand dollars a month on that property. You're going to do whatever it takes to get to that million dollars. And that million dollars doesn't matter because what you care about is the outcome, which is the money. Right. And like, making that property cash flow positive. And in real estate, if you can hold on to it for a decade, you're going to get your money back. Like real estate's one of those things. Yes, there's ebbs and flows, but for the most part, it's always constantly going up. A house now is worth more than a house 20 years ago. And if you can learn to make that more valuable, then it's going to be more valuable sooner. Uh, where can people find you on social media or the internet? So you can keep legacy wealth is our website. That's where like we're developing this new program where we help people buy their first income properties and then keep the money that they make in their businesses and their investments now for generations to come by teaching wealth and success principles to their kids, to their families. That's keep legacy I'm tab Thorell on Instagram, Tabitha Thorell on Facebook. Um, all A's, T A B A T H A. So I'm pretty easy to find. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was nice meeting you and talking to you. Yes. Thank you so much, Richard. And no problem. So, on that note, uh, everybody, thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast, and we'll see you on the next episode. Goodbye.